Hello there. My name is Ron Calcutt. I'm a fisherman and I make my living writing about fish and fishermen. Most of the time I love this job, but there's one story keeps cropping up that I wish I never had to write. And that's the story about the men who lose their lives fishing from the rocks. You know, on the whole, rock fishing is no more dangerous than any other sport. And yet, in the Sydney area alone, just four locations kill enough men each year to make rock fishing one of the world's most dangerous amateur sports. I'd like to take you into a fascinating world, the world of the rock hopper. The sea shows little respect for man or his efforts to tame it. Before the power of the sea, man's engineering achievements crumble. With advanced technology that can take him to the moon, man is still unable to cope with the primitive violence of the oceans. But anger is just one of the sea's many moods. If her anger is unmatched in ferocity, then so is her mood of peace and tranquility unmatched in beauty. Perhaps this is the key to the fisherman's dedication to his sport. The challenge lies not in the capture of a fish, but in man's efforts to relate and cope with Earth's most primitive environment. The sea makes no distinction between the amateur and the professional. Once away from the protection of man-made harbours and major ports, fishermen are forced to run the gauntlet each day to reach the fishing grounds. In many places, the sea can only be reached through river mouths, and shooting the bar on the way home is just part of a day's work to these professionals. Even on a relatively calm day, shooting the bar can be quite a lively experience, and not all of them make it. Every year, new bones come to rest on these bars when boats are overturned. Out on the open sea, the boatman can relax and enjoy his sport. The only threat posed by these powerful ocean swells is seasickness. But in that no man's land, where sea and land meet, every ocean swell is a threat. These are the ramparts, the land's frontline defence against the constant assault of the sea. This is the rock fisherman's world, and it's often a violent world. Every year fishermen are swept from the rocks and drowned. In the Sydney area alone, Four popular fishing spots may have accounted for over 150 lives. I say may have accounted because there are no separate statistics kept on rock fishing fatalities. They all come under the general heading of accidental death by drowning, so there is no way of knowing exactly how many men have lost their lives this way. All we know for sure is that rock fishing is one of the world's most dangerous amateur sports and has a lethal pastime run second only to weekend driving in the family car. Perhaps to understand the rock fisherman, you need to fish the rocks for yourself. One and the same with the sea and the wind, walking ground that has been tortured and fashioned by storms that go beyond the memory of man. It is a unique world, and its inhabitants, a very different breed of men.
The gulf at Currakarang in Sydney's Royal National Park is one of the lesser known killer rock spots. Like many of the most dangerous rocks, it looks completely safe until it is too late. Even to the eye of an experienced rock fisherman, the gently sloping rock at the gulf seems to offer a perfect escape route and an emergency. But it's a trap. A succession of big waves will bring tons of water over the top at several points, converging into a raging downhill torrent which can knock a man off his feet and sweep him into the gutter. On a big day at Karakarang, water movement is on a monumental scale. According to local professionals, only one man has survived a wipeout in this area, and many have died here. I know just how it feels to be trapped at the Gulf, and this unlikely looking perch is the safest place to be in a tight situation. It's the last place a newcomer would want to be, and that's a classic example of local knowledge making a life or death difference in an emergency. Like most of the locations that regularly take lives, the Gulf is a fishing hotspot. For fishing like this, regulars are prepared to take a calculated risk. They pit their experience and local knowledge against the power of the sea. And when the fish are on, they stretch their luck right to the limit. A rising tide and a slight lapse of concentration are all it takes to push a fisherman's luck past the limit. These men are members of rock fishing's most elite fraternity, the blackfish specialists. The blackfish men are a race apart. Each year they catch more fish than all other fishermen combined, and each year the sea catches some of them. They fish for the one fish to the exclusion of all others. They have their own uniform, their own language, their own highly specialised fishing tackle. Their quarry is a comparatively small, timid vegetarian, excellent to eat and a scrappy fighter at the end of a line. A rock like this is a typical blackfish spot. The green weed growing over a good part of the rock is the natural food of the blackfish. As waves break over the rock, particles of weed are broken away and carried back into the white water where the blackfish wait. On the high tide, the fish are able to come right to the edge of the rock where they browse on the weed growth. The very thing that makes the rock so attractive to the blackfish makes it dangerous for man. The weed can be as slippery as ice. To help keep their footing on rocks like these, the black fishermen wear serrated metal plates on the soles of their shoes. The steel teeth of the cleats cut through the weed and find a hold on the rock below. But nothing can stand against the power of a big wave, and once off his feet, the fisherman is in real trouble. The sea will be his last problem, the rocks themselves his first. 
Just like a little volcano, the lip at the top of the barnacle is razor sharp. A fisherman washed off his feet can go for a long slide on rocks like these, and on the way, there are many, many thousands of razor edges waiting. Then, finally, perhaps seriously hurt, he ends up in here. Many fishermen, some of them good swimmers, disappear from sight seconds after entering the water. Others last longer, but most lose their lives in a matter of minutes. No seriously injured man is a good swimmer. Although typical of the flat, weed-covered rocks favoured by the black fishermen, this is one of the safer spots. And this is one of the worst of them. Yellow rock, a sewer outlet. Estimates of fatalities here range as high as 60 lives lost. Yellow rock is the most slippery and certainly one of the most treacherous rocks to be found anywhere in Australia. In a big sea, huge volumes of water sweep over the rock from several points. If the fisherman fails to make it to the stake or loses his grip, he has little hope. Very few fishermen have ever survived to swim in this water, but it's surprising how many of them choose to take the risks involved to fish in it. The smell is overwhelming, and it's hard to understand how anybody could enjoy eating a fish taken from an environment like this. But yellow rock produces fish, and as long as they are there, some people will choose to fish it, regardless of the risks involved. Another sewerage outlet, another area with a bad reputation, the Doughboy. In a rising sea, there are no safe perches at the Doughboy. The whole area is a trap. The flat rocks are backed by a series of ledges. The fisherman has nowhere to go when a wave comes, and the backwash will almost certainly take him straight into the sea. At low tide, the big rock out the front looks safe enough, but it's backed by a gutter that will close out very quickly with a rising sea and tide. It too is a trap. The Doughboy has killed a lot of men, and 1973 saw two double fatalities there. <laughs> 